মহসিন তো প্রফেশনাল অ্যাঙ্করিং হচ্ছে কিন্তু আমি অ্যাঙ্করিং না আমি সূত্রধর সূত্রধর লোকমান <laughs> মঞ্জুর ভাই মঞ্জির I think all of the surgeons are waiting outside. The, Mr. Kamrul also added them to a, in, the, in our session. Uh, before starting, uh, I will talk some few words regarding the IPDI for the surgeons. IPDI is an interactive platform by the professionals of Viriat Arena. The motto with which is to help attain and maintain professional standards and excellent in their respective fields and beyond. IPDA implements a wide variety of experience training, formal education or advanced professional learning intended to improve professional knowledge, competence, skill and effectiveness. At the end, all the activities of the organization are directed to develop knowledge, skilled and human professionals for the 21st century. Our objectives is there some awareness program, continuing medical education, participation in professional activities, research activities, approaches to professional development, skill-based training, accomplished of targeted assignment. Uh, we, we do make more professional research activities and we start in the pandemic era, IPDA virtual classroom for the MD DECAD students, IPDA meet the experts, our, you know, our intervention colleague, Dr. Ashok Shed, Dr. Mithu Samuel, Dr. John Sisos from the USA, Dr. Imad Seban from the Italy, lots of experts here. Today, Dr. Tiag, you see here. IPDA Catholic manual is going on. We are working for the Catholic technician nurses, also a refresher course. And we start our IPDI, Hello IPDI YouTube channel. It's the most, uh, in this channel, we work with I go on. We are completed some projects in the prevalence of metabolic syndrome among the Bangladeshi adolescents. Also, we are ongoing projects with the trends of atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, risk factor, and outcome among the Bangladeshi population. Our upcoming projects in the screening for cervical cancer, by via test among selected garments work in Chattogram. We not only IPD, not only work in the cardiologist also, we do different arena. You see the, our, our completed projects in the BMRC. We also report report. And also we do the school children's metabolic syndrome. And uh, we work in the Chidagang. The ethical community also clear the garments work in Chidagang. We, you know everybody, we are the virtual classroom last uh, one year and meet the expert session. 
So lots of Ashok Shed, Dr. Khanna, manual series, you, uh, everybody uh, attending in our session. So we also also work on the technician nursery differential courses. Two six already already on or not only Bangladesh, Nepal, also uh, India, also at in their session. We did the differential course for the fellows in the Hotel Edison in the 13th March 2020. The last program in Bangladesh in the live program in person. After that, no program is over in Europe or Corona. We are waiting for the live program in recently because we are we hope. Vaccine, after getting the vaccine, we can meeting together in person. We have the IPDA, Hello IPDA YouTube channel. You just click, type the www.hello.health and scroll down, Hello website, and keep subscribe, and you can enjoy our every series. IPDA virtual classroom, meet the expert, a different playlist. You can enjoy your desired topic. Is, is our IPDA admin? Our Professor Abdul Wadi Choudhury, he is our chairperson, our mentor, and Dr. Professor Mishkat Ahmed, Dr. Khalid Mohsin, also Khalid Aisak Rasulukhan, our co-chairman, our main um, four uh, members, four members, Dr. Manwar Islam, Dr. Arifur Rahman Shajol, Dr. Muthi Rahman, and Dr. Tanvir Ahmed, they are our working force. But we know we have to go a long way, but we are hope last one year, you, your participants are tremendous helping us to do the great job. I hope will be uh, succeed in our desired dreams and be so. So thank you everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'm requesting Professor Abdul Wadi Chudhi, sir, please opening your session, some comments. Good evening, everybody, and assalamu alaikum. Today, uh, we being the cardiologist, actually want to have something uh, known from our surgeon and uh, surgeon colleagues. Minimally invasive cardiac surgery is like uh, what we have, new skin in the block, something like that. And it's very intriguing and also uh, very attractive. Because if you can avoid a big scar and the trauma of having your chest open totally, that will be very helpful from the patient perspective. And from the surgeon's perspective, it will be, it will lead to more prestige on his part. Whatever it is, if the outcome is good, the procedure is always welcome, any procedure. The profound important thing is whether the outcome is good. And for that reason, we have to know when to do it, why to do it, and when not to do it. In this regard, today, Professor Jayak Doshi is going to enlighten us. I hope as a cartilage, I'm going to enjoy it and our cardiac surgeon colleagues will be enriching themselves and they'll be also enlightening us with their opinions. Thank you, everybody. I'm requesting Dr. Poshantik Chanda. He's the uh, senior consultant of Square Hospital. Uh, please uh, introduce our today's expert, Dr. Chirak Doshi. Professor, uh, Dr. Oshanta Kumar Chanda, please introduce Dr. Chirak Doshi for our fellow colleagues. Dr. Chanda, do you hear me? Okay, okay, yeah, good evening. Uh, respected panelists, respected course directors, co-moderator, teachers, and respected audience. Very good evening. I must thank first IPDA for uh, uh, foundation for their initiatives. During this pandemic time, they have taken and chosen different aspects of uh, professional development. But at present, today, they have chosen for cardiac surgical procedure, which is nowadays very attractive alternative to uh, gold standard open heart procedure, like minimally invasive surgery. So I must thank them, especially my friend, very good student and teacher, brilliant, uh, uh, scholar, Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury, brilliant clinician, brilliant organizer, Dr. Mohsin Ahmed, and also our uh, delighted uh, panelist. Before going to Professor Chirak Dushi, I uh, must thank him. Basically, he has taken all the trouble to visit Dhaka and operated in our alma mater NICVD, uh, total arterial CABG through MICS access, and also double valve 
procedure through MICS. I must congratulate him to give a thrust to our uh, cardiac surgical fraternity in Bangladesh to spread this MICS procedure uh, uh, in Bangladesh. Professor Chirag Dushi is a versatile surgeon. He is doing all sorts of uh, cardiac surgeries, special interest with minimally invasive cardiac surgery. He is at present working as head of the department of Yuvan Mehta Institute of Cardiology and Research Center, having 1,251 beds dedicated for cardiology and cardiac surgery, and 15 operating theater, which is one of the highest number possibly in the world, as uh, I must say, and also six cath labs. In an average, they are doing uh, 6,000 plus cases in a year. And with all those things, they have dedicated one or two OR for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. And with a very limited and uh, limited time and uh, short notice, he has participated for last one year for our many CMEs and webinars and enlightened us to start this uh, minimal invasive surgery, which is prestigious. And today this occasion is important because our cardiological colleagues are arranging this one. If we can uh, convince them so we'll get more and more passion uh, for minimally invasive surgery. So with these <clears throat> kind words, I like to uh, congratulate and welcome uh, Professor Chirag Doshi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ashrafulak Siam, our another moderator, uh, please continue your program. Today's uh, moderate the session, Dr. Prashanto and Ashram, we and Professor Wadud doing some rest, they can rest today. Dr. Prashanto and Dr. Siam, Siam please, uh, continue your session. Dr. Ashraf Aksyam, do you hear me? Uh, please unmute. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, please. Ashraf, you have to line to the Hello. 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 Do you hear me? Yes, yes. To device, active device, bondo korte hobe. Active device out hai. Uh, Dr. Pashanto, please. Uh, I think Dr. Chirag also uh, taken his part to the start your session. Dr. Chirag Joshi. Yeah. Uh, please, Hello. you study your session. May I share my slides? I mean, you share your screen. Yeah. You can, can you, will you allow me to share my screen? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. We're waiting for your lectures. Hello, am I audible then? Yes, yeah. you're yeah, audible, uh, yes. Yeah, first of all, very good evening to all of you. And uh, it is always my pleasure and privilege to be, uh, whether in, in physicality or online like symposium as Dr. Prashant uh, Chandra has mentioned that uh, I've been very closely associated with Bangladesh for almost more than a year now. And honestly speaking, this is one of the rare opportunity uh, to get the cardiologists on board. You know, all these times uh, uh, we have uh, cardiac surgeons uh, online or uh, whenever we talk about minimally invasive surgery or any sort of surgeries, I, I, I must admit that uh, this IPDI foundation is doing an extremely wonderful job and uh, now, uh, as Dr. Chandra has mentioned that uh, I need to convince cardiologists whether this surgery can be done in most of the patients or not, whether it, it can be done with safety or not, like Dr. Abdul uh, rightly said, whether this surgery can be done uh, with the same amount of similar results with a good quality outcome. And that is why uh, I, I'll try and uh, uh, convince or I'll try and deliver my talk in such a way that uh, uh, I'm sure at the end of talk, my all the cardiologists who are there on the board, they they would get convinced. Uh, 
So like Dr. Prashant has already introduced uh, me there, this is where I'm working at this moment. Uh, uh, it is in the Western part of India, a city called Ahmedabad. And uh, the hospital name is UN Meta Heart Institute. Uh, for last few months, we opened up our new setup. We expanded our uh, facility. And now as like he's rightly said, uh, we have now 15 modular theaters with uh, one theater is dedicated for only for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Uh, as of uh, now, we haven't uh, had our uh, endoscope system, but now we, very recently we have started doing uh, minimally invasive surgery through even using endoscope. Uh, so this is our new expansion. Uh, people who are not into this branch or who are uh, beginners or who are a uh, well-experienced surgeon but never witnessed or never done uh, minimal invasive cardiac surgery, obviously they have a lot of questions in their mind, a lot of doubts and queries in their mind that why we should be doing minimal invasive cardiac surgery, how it can be done, like in selected, whether it can be done in selected patients or it can be done in a majority of patients. And if it can be done in uh, selected or majority of patients, how it can be done safely. So I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about all, uh, I'll try and cover all the aspects of minimal invasive surgery in the next few minutes. So as I said, uh, people who have been doing this uh, uh, surgery for a uh, decade or more than a decade, uh, there is a, all, always there is a doubt in their mind that we, if, we, if we can produce a result uh, through, minimal, uh, through a conventional way, why there's a need of going into minimal invasive cardiac surgery. Then obviously uh, we have our uh, very, uh, cardiologist colleagues on board. As I said earlier, uh, whatever they do, they do a wonderful job. Uh, they do uh, procedures without incisions and with no time, with excellent outcome. And patient then they they can go back to in their normal activity time, maybe in few days, uh, even if if they do a complex angioplasty or even if they do rota, or even if they do a percutaneous valve replacement, uh, most of the patients, they can uh, you know, go back into their activity in very short period of time. So surgeon, as a surgeon also, we need to do something uh, which is uh, uh, less invasive, but at the same time, the safety come first. So we do not only compete with our own cardiologists, but we have a, comp a very strong healthy competitions among ourselves. Uh, so definitely there's a need or need of this art to do a minimal invasive surgery or any surgery for that matter with a less uh, invasiveness. As of now, there are five levels of uh, minimal invasive cardiac surgery. Uh, as you seen in this chart that uh, very recently, most of these uh, surgeries or valve replacement even can be done through a percutaneous way. So I will not go into depth of this. Why we should be doing mi minimal invasive cardiac surgery? So again, it is very important thing is safety. Safety come first. So uh, after doing almost few thousands of minimal invasive cardiac surgery, I would say it is as safe as conventional cardiac surgery. So people who have not done it or not seen it or uh, uh, from distance or from, they believe that this surgery is not safe, but I would say in majority of cases, this surgery is safe as the conventional surgery. Undoubtedly, it is less invasive, less scar. Uh, so healing process is really very fast. Uh, it is uh, undoubtedly, again, it is reproducible. That means if somebody can do it, I can do it. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is definitely a faster ambulations after minimally invasive surgery because here we do not cut bone at all. Or even if we cut bone, uh, that would be around a couple of inches uh, in, in the sternum. So the healing is very fast and the recovery is total. Uh, like Dr. Pro Ab Ab Abdul said, uh, it is definitely a cosmetic surgery. And uh, we all know that uh, once the mediastinal mediastin mediastin sets in, in our uh, sternal patients, it's really difficult to tackle them. The mortality and morbidity of uh, 
any mediastinitis, especially a deep wound infections, uh, is way, way high than the normal procedures. So you can definitely eliminate this uh, uh, complications by uh, means of mix. But certain things that as a surgeon, we have to keep in our mind that the amount of torture, I would say, the, con the law of conservation, the amount of torture that is involved in any procedure for that matter, whether it is open heart surgery or uh, any complex uh, coronary intervention surgery, uh, intervention is constant. So if you really want to reduce the, the torture from your patients, the surgeon should be uh, you know, ready to uh, take that challenge, take that pain. So in short, pa your patient will be really happy at the end of the procedure, but the surgeon should be uh, uh, able to transfer that pain of patients to themselves. That, that is a very important thing that one must keep in mind. So if, if one is ready for this, this surgery, I would say, is a wonderful surgery. But yes, there are certain challenges that we all have to overcome these challenges. And what are these challenges? So any new procedures that comes in the, uh, our uh, adventurium that, have, that, that will come with the challenges. And then first is training. That is the key point of any procedures. And mix, again, even if you're a trained surgeon, if, even if you've done a cardiac surgery for one decade or two decades, this is something requires a training, thorough training. So give, you have to give a time to this uh, program. If, uh, most of the people that I've observed, what they do is they uh, train themselves for a day or two, uh, they observe somebody, and then they, they stand them themselves as a minimal invasive cardiac surgeon. But this surgery requires a thorough training, a training of maybe a 15 days, one month with maybe you, you might have to attend a few workshops or a few webinars, few seminars with a different masters, from a different masters, I would say. And once you are trained, every procedures, once you uh, go back to your place, you need to plan your case. So you need to have a plan A, B, and C all the time in your mind. And you need to have a right equipment with you. Even this equipment may not require every time, but you'd never know when these equip equipments will bail out. Uh, for an example, I'll just give you a small example, not pusher surgeons. They might be knowing about not pushers. Sometime in a heavy patient or the pain, the valves are really deep or the proximal, when you do a proximal anastomosis where your finger cannot reach or other equipments cannot reach, you require not pushers to push, to tie the notch. So what I'm saying is you need to have the right set of equipments. And obviously you need to have a right energetic team because why I say it has to be a combination of your cardiologist, your perfusionist, your anesthetist, your own management because this, uh, if, when you start this program, uh, you will require a positive people around you. You, you can, if, if uh, they do not, uh, if, if they do not trust you, uh, then as a surgeon, as an individual, uh, this procedure is a bit difficult, a uh, challenging. So you need to have a right combination of team. So what I was telling you is you have, you need to prepare yourself, right? So work really hard, train yourself hard, and then hunt for a selected cases to begin with. Uh, there are certain uh, prerequisite, again, as I said earlier, there are certain uh, qualities that the surgeon should acquire uh, before they start this program. First and foremost, it is, not, it is not like the other surgeon is doing, that is why I want to just have a look of it and then I'll, I'll, I'll see whether I can do it or not, but one has to have a willingness to do it. So that ded dedication should come from within. So if you are willing to do it, this procedure is for them. Obviously, once you have learned it, once you have mastered it, uh, you need to have a confidence that yes, I can do it. You need to develop a different kind of vision. That is a focused vision. Like uh, all these years, when we do a conventional surgery, we see a, a uh, you know, hard uh, in front of you. You need you don't have to see everything in a one go. 
so what you need to do is you have to develop end of kind of vision you know only area of interest that you will visualize so this is a very unique concept that uh, I'm just observing in my own patients. The gentleman on the left is, is seeing from above and the gentleman who is on the right is seeing from either in the same level or beneath. So the gentleman on the right is a minimal invasive surgeon and on the left of your screen is a conventional surgeon. Again, hand movements are really important because uh, when we do a coronary, especially a coronary complex coronary surgeries, uh, our training uh, said that uh, uh, only the finger and wrist should move. But uh, having said that, in minimally invasive cardiac surgery, we need to hold a little longer and slender and heavier instruments than the conventional one. So here also we need to use our elbow and shoulder as well. So uh, this surgery is not only possible with fingers and the wrist. Again, the the assistance that you get in this surgery is minimal because certain things that only can surgeon can see and can help themselves. So you would, uh, you know, when even when you do a conventional surgery, you, you should start practicing that you require a least assistant for every, every steps, whether it is anastomosis or going on palm, opening the sternum or closer, closing the sternum. As I said, your vision should be like Arjuna. Um, like, yes, you need to have a, a very good team approach. Approach Then uh, this is what I call as a spa approach, where your surgeon, perfusionist, anesthetist, and uh, obviously management also equally play a very important role. Uh, th these are all e equipments which are required, necessary, mandatory, when you start this program. Different sets of uh, e equipments. Uh, once you have all this uh, uh, sort of uh, requisites with you, uh, obviously, what are the goals that we are going to achieve? Whether it is a less invasiveness, whether it is all about scar, I would say this is one of the factors that small scar obviously heals rapidly, uh, with a, uh, obviously produce a less trauma, patient will feel really happy. Uh, but what is more important that you need to produce the identical quality of results to a full open procedures. And that is, should be the goal of this procedure, not only the incision size, size or uh, cost, or maybe a similar uh, bypass time or operating time. But to me, two things are very important. One is the identical quality to full open procedures. And second, when you are stuck, you, you need to have a plan to get out of these problems, get out of the uh, uh, whatever uh, uh, troubles that you come across. So you need to have a troubleshooting for all these steps. So these two things are very important when I do a procedure. So one of the hypotheses that says that all procedures, all uh, possible cardiac surgery can be done through minimal invasive cardiac surgery. Is it true? So there is an alternative therapy, hypothesis which says that yes, it can be done in selected group of patients. So I will go uh, in, in depth of technicality uh, now. Uh, as, a, as a minimal invasive cardiac surgeon, I, whenever patient walks in, into my clinic, I see them as a mixed candidate. So whether this uh, procedures can be done in all uh, sort of patients, so I would say the numbers are maybe 50-50. So whenever patient walks in into the clinic, what I look for, whether patient is lean or obese or uh, really stubborn or muscular. A second, obviously I see for their age, whether they are young or old patients, and uh, I see whether they are female or male. So having said that, the most difficult and challenging patients who are really obese and old and female. They are a very difficult subset of patients. So if possible, I would avoid doing uh, minimal invasive surgery in those group of patients. And uh, there are certain conditions, generalized conditions that also will tell me whether the patient is suitable for minimal uh, mix or not. Uh, if patients having a strong COPD or severe COPD, 
or uh, with very deformed uh, uh, spine, uh, kyphoscoliosis, or with having very bad peripheral vascular disease. So these are the conditions that I would not uh, like to see in my patients when I opt for minimal invasive cardiac surgery. And there are certain hearts that I would not like to see in our patients. They are like huge cardiomegaly with some sort of pericardial uh, disease, pericardial uh, uh, calcifications, and patients with uh, very concentric hypertrophied heart and very low ejection fractions, which is like less than 20 or sometimes 15 and uh, ongoing ischemia. So I would rather not touch this kind of patients, you know? And uh, uh, obviously when you start, uh, now we take more and more of uh, challenging patients for last few years. But when I started this program, I always look for a very good, uh, a right patient. That doesn't mean that even selected, best of the best selected patients will not put you in trouble, but the probability of putting you in trouble is less. So select your patients wisely. So uh, say, having said that, uh, you hunt for your patient's heart and then procedure would be very, very easy. So don't uh, uh, jump into taking away, uh, uh, you know, acute patients, uh, patients who are in pulmonary edema, patients with ongoing ischemia, patients who's uh, already received the CPR, right? So try and avoid uh, this kind of sort of cases to begin with. So uh, going into the depth of tips and tricks of every individual procedures that we perform through mix. So there are generalized uh, preparation of patients. So what are these general, general preparations that we do in all, all our patients, uh, except for op pump uh, CABG, uh, our uh, choice of uh, ventilation is uh, uh, two lung ventilations. Uh, that is uh, with single, uh, uh, single lumen ventilations with intermittent apnea. Again, a positioning of the patient is really important and that all depends on whether you do, we are doing a, a, a CABG or VAL patients. So that uh, cha will change your uh, position of the patients. Uh, you always apply external defibrillators. That is the key point. You know, you never know when, when these defibrillators will, will bail out. Uh, if you do not have this facility, external defibrillators, uh, then use a neonatal uh, pedals. Don't try to use the adult one because the adult will, will not go into the uh, these incision itself, right? So, uh, and here we have to put a two pedals uh, from a small incision. So use a neonatal, they are really small. So it can easily go into the LV side and one will stay on the RV. Paint and drip your patients in such a way that anytime if catastrophe happens, so you can immediately convert in this patient. Do not hesitate your uh, convert. Do not hesitate. Sometimes it happens. You know, it is a matter of some 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 sort of. I, I don't say ego, but uh, uh, you wait uh, that till the time patient deteriorates. Uh, don't hesitate. Uh, if you think that uh, this complication cannot be handled. With, uh, with the same incision, you try either increase your incision size or convert them into sternotomy. Again, having said that, paint and drip both the groins to begin with, because sometimes you may uh, 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 have difficulty in cannulating from right side. So you can easily jump into the left side and keep all instruments ready by the side of the patients whether even if you are very confident, very sure that you can do it without uh, uh, converting them into sternotomy, but uh, prepare yourself. And in female, all the incisions should be uh, beneath the breast, you know? So that is how you can avoid uh, a bad scar on the breast tissue, especially in a younger group of patients or uh, in, in the female children. Uh, with the developing breast. So uh, having said that, this is very, very important. The first and foremost, uh, when you, once you have decided that, yes, uh, you want to do a procedure through a minimal invasive excess, the first thing that I see is an X-ray, patient X-ray. And that is how I decide uh, whether I should go from a third, fourth, or fifth place. 
whether I should go, let, my incision should be more medially or laterally, everything I decide on the x-ray. So it is very important to count the space of correctly and see the x-ray uh, even if you before you even if you put your skin incisions. So as I said, whether to, I have to go, whether uh, if the heart is really big and LA is almost touching on the right of the right border of the uh, thorax. And if you put your incision more medially, then it is really difficult to see mitral wall through that approach. So your incision is by default, it has to be very laterally. And when, you're, when your heart is more uh, on the left side, when everything is pushed on the left, even for your ASG, tricuspid, mitral, or for that matter, aorta, then try and put your incision more medially than laterally. Uh, for CABG, uh, if your uh, grafts are low OMs and PDA, uh, to put, a, put an incision uh, at the side of the apex or at the most one space above the apex, but never two spaces above the apex. Otherwise, delivering the apex or delivering the heart into the uh, incision would be really difficult. For ostium secundum, um, you can use throat as four space. But if you really want to tackle the PAPVC, uh, superior vena cover, uh, SVC type uh, PAPVC, your incision should be at least one space above than the mid of the RA. And that is how we can tackle this uh, situations with a lot ease. Uh, for AVR, most of the AVR, it is always a second intercostal space, anterior uh, thoracotomy. But uh, especially when the aorta is dilated, when the annulus is shifted down, uh, more inferiorly, uh, sometimes you might have to uh, go through a third space, but it is very in very, very small percentage of patients. How to establish CPB? That is again a very, very important thing. Uh, most of the time I go through a right, uh, using a right femoral or femoral excess, and uh, uh, I dissect everything uh, with the use of uh, diathermy till the, I, I reach the vessels to avoid the lymphoria. Uh, and if possible, um, uh, use never use the, uh, uh, what I say is a scissors to cut the uh, fat or fascia. Uh, your incision site should be at the level of inguinal ligament because where you get a maximum diameter of common femoral artery. Uh, obviously the choice of cannula is again, these, these, that all depends on the anticipated floor and uh, according to body surface area. Uh, but never uh, try and use the uh, oversize your cannulas, uh, never ever, because that those uh, things can put you in trouble. Um, cannulation technique, it can be Seldinger technique, percutaneous technique, or maybe open Seldinger technique, or uh, open uh, uh, technique where you put a transverse incision on femoral artery and vertical incisions on femoral vein. But you must have TE all the time when you are cannulating when you're putting patients on CPB, that will guard you and that will give you more confidence for, for establishment of CPB. So uh, there are again generalized uh, steps, SVC and IVC looping. Uh, what happened is uh, uh, when we do open uh, surgery, uh, we try and loop SVC and IVC even if patient is not on pump, but in mix, uh, you must loop SVC IVC once you are uh, on pump, once the heart is emptied. And uh, most of the time when we do open uh, uh, surgery, we try and loop from uh, right to left. But uh, in this particular case, it has to be from, uh, you go from the surgeon side to the opposite side rather than left to right side. So uh, it is exactly opposite. Uh, uh, of way of doing uh, as compared to a uh, conventional looping. Cardiologic annulations is again the where you have to put a purse string. In most of the cases, when we do open, we put a purse string above the aortic fat line. We always see a fat line on the aorta and we try and take a purse string, especially in conventional, uh, superior to the uh, this fat line. But in this uh, mix, you have to put a purse string or below or inferior to this fat line, 
and more interlaterally. Use a long CP cannula. So th this cannula will not come into your view of your uh, surgery or vision. Aortic cross cross clamp. So we have a different cross clamp available. Either it can be a cheat wood clamp or uh, else we have a porta flexible clamp that also can be used uh, sometime. And cheat wood, whenever we use a cheat wood clamp, we usually insert this cheat wood clamp from either from the same space, but from a mid or posterior axillary line or one space above the uh, space that we open from. So I'll, I'll go into the individual procedures, how individual procedure can be done safely with few tips and tricks that I usually follow. As I mentioned earlier, try to keep the incision anterolateral than only lateral. So it will be more near to the mitral valve. Again, choose the right space, whichever space falls into mid of the RA that you decide on the X-ray, you open from that space. When you have a, uh, uh, when the drainage is an issue, uh, you don't mind putting a, don't put a cannula. I use the wrong word cannula. Put just a sum sucker into RA and that also works as your cannula. When you have a small LA, uh, do not uh, uh, open LA at all because what happens is when you have a small LA, it is really difficult to put a, uh, your uh, retractor through this small LA. So once you place that, you are, in fact, your AML also will come into the uh, retractor blade. So when you have a very small LA like three centimeter, 3.5 centimeter, use the transeptal approach. So go through a RA, that would be much easier. Um, um, you can use a self retaining retractor, but for long years I've been using Divas retractor as a LA retraction. When you have a large, huge LA, dissect the intraterial groove, and then you can really reach near to the mitral wall. So this is one of the uh, simple trick that I follow when I have a LA, which is like more than seven, eight, 10 centimeter. I always try and dissect as much as possible intraterial groove. So in the, when, once you have done this uh, at your at your tromy, uh, and you have a difficult mitral wall, mitral wall is far off from you, or if it is a redo mitral wall, everything is pushed on the left side. It is difficult to cut and take it. Then once you have excised the wall, it is difficult to suture uh, it back. So what uh, I would say, you just take, cut only a few centimeters, take a suture, sutures, and then pull it up. So what you can actually, uh, you know, uh, have a better visualization of the wall. So it is what I, call it as a cut suture, cut sutures. So don't cut a mitral wall in a one go, only cut and they take a sutures and then cut and then take a sutures. And then this would be really easy. Forward hook needle holding for AML sutures because a lot of time your forward placement of sutures will not uh, help uh, or will be very difficult to do it from a small incision. So when you have a small LA or the uh, AML is really away from you, try and take a forward uh, in a hoop fashion. And this will uh, uh, give you a way ease of uh, placing the sutures. Again, never oversize your valve. Uh, whenever possible, you always tie with the hands. Uh, most of the time, I'm, I'm sure people who have observed me uh, who have visited me, they see I use uh, uh, index fingers to push my notes instead of using index, uh, the index, uh, sorry, I use my middle finger to push my notes instead of using index. The, that gives me an extra length of, uh, for tying the notes. So if it is not possible, always use note pusher to uh, tie the notes. Uh, whatever you cut, you try and suture in two layers and uh, always do a de do a de airing under TE guidance. I'll just go through a quick video of uh, mitral valve, how it can be done. 
So this is what I was talking about, uh, very small subareolar incisions in a male. It is hardly maybe a four or five centimeter uh, size. Uh, once you have opened the pericardium in a vertical fashion, the next step would be uh, going on our uh, femoral femoral bypass. In this particular patients, we have but uh, we have converted to open cell division techniques. And for venous, I've used the uh, open semi, which, which I call is a semi cell division technique through over the guide wires. And once you have on pump, then um, uh, put up, as I mentioned earlier, your cardioplegia, suture cardioplegia uh, posturing would be a lower level and use a long cardioplegia needle. This is how I use a cross clamp. This, in this particular case, we use a cheat wood. So one of the limb of the cheat wood will go into the transverse sinus that will push on the superior side and then uh, clamp as high as possible on the aorta. Again, for a large LA, I use, I always uh, uh, just take the intraterial groove. This was, I was talking about cut and then take a few sutures. In this particular case, uh, I've cut the uh, mitral valve completely and then taking a stitches from PML and going into the anti -clo uh, clockwise positions. And for AML, this was what I was talking about, taking a uh, forward hook stitches, never oversize your valve. In this particular patient, we've used a mechanical bilateral valve from Abbott. And as you see, in this case, I am pushing the notch with my middle finger instead of index fingers. So it gives me extra length to tie the notes. And whenever it is not possible to push your fingers, uh, use the knot pushers to fix your notes. And always uh, close the LN two layers. And once you are done with your, once you're happy, uh, you know, uh, everything is okay, you can wean off. And this is how I suture it back using 6-0 polypropylene in most of our cases. Uh, this, is this was just a, a, a video of mitral wall. Then coming to the AVR, how it can be done. Uh, when CT aerodogram, a lot of people ask me whether I do CT aerodogram in all, all, all of my patients or not. Uh, when I started this program, I used to do aerodogram in almost all my patients, but now I do it in a very selected group of patients. Whenever I have a doubt, uh, especially when patient is obese, uh, very old patients, and if I feel that the aorta is really dilated on x-ray, or if my echographer says the aorta is more than four centimeters, and then yes, I, I try and get the CT aerodogram, complete CT aerodogram. And one of the points that I, I missed that if the aorta is really leftward, when the aorta is not seen at all on, on your x-ray, everything is pushed on the beneath the sternum, then I, I do a CT aerodogram in selected group patients. So what uh, extra information that I get through uh, from uh, CT aerodogram, one of the uh, information that I get that the distance between, from the sternum to the aorta, so if the uh, distance is more than 10 centimeter, then I would say it is difficult, not that it is not doable through a, a rat that is right interior thoracotomy, but it is a bit difficult. So, so when uh, you start this program, you must get a CT aerogram in almost all your patients. And these are the parameters that you should look for. One is the distance from the sternum to the aorta. The second thing that we see is exactly what I said is whether the aorta is rightward or not. So if the aorta is more towards right, then it is good to start from a right anterior thoracotomy. Again, the angle is very important. If the angle is more than 45 degree from the sagittal plane, that means whatever you see, it is very easily accessible through a right mini thoracotomy. And if the angle is less, less than 45 degree, then visualizing the special right uh, cusp would be really difficult especially in small annulars and the very heavily calcified valve. So this angle also will tell you whether you should do it through a mini sternomy or mini thoracotomy. Obviously other information like uh, 
peripheral vascular disease, focal dissections, uh, that also uh, information that you get it through aerodogram. And that is why I, I do it for uh, very old patients. Uh, uh, this is uh, like when you get a pleural additions, a dense pleural additions. Previously, it was one of the contraindications due to uh, when you get a uh, pleural dense additions. But nowadays, uh, even if we get a plural additions, there's no more contraindication. And this is what we see at the uh, when we get a aerogram. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, most of the thoracotomy that do it we through do it through second space only when your aorta is really dilated, uh, and when you think that the going through a second space would be very very difficult to visualize your annulus. So use a third space, or else even if you are open from second space, do not hesitate to cut the costal cartilage. And that is how you can increase your exposure. Uh, uh, only in maybe five or 10% of your uh, mini thoracotomy AVR, you might have to compromise or sacrifice right into a memory artery. And you might have to uh, cut the costal cartilage. And at the end, you can obviously re-approximate re them back. Uh, Yes, yeah, these are the difficult scenarios I mentioned earlier. Uh, how you can in enhance your exposures? So, like I said, Rima, you can re sacrifice your Rima. So, you can actually go really medially. You can disarticulate costal cartilage, that is, third costal cartilage, and you can increase your exposure. You might uh, dissect the thymus, you excise them completely. That is how also you can enhance your exposure and take as many as pericardial stay. Uh, from both sides. So uh, in most of the cases, I only take stages on the right side. I don't take stages on the left side. But sometimes when your aorta is big and annulus is far off, you take even stitches on the right of the pericard, left of the pericardium and pull as hard as possible. That will again rotate the aorta and brings the aorta more towards right. Again, um, um, you have to win the left side of the system. So you, you can use RSPV for venting and you must clamp as high as possible because if you clamp on the middle of the aorta, so most of the time when you pr perform surgery, this clamp will come in your way of surgery. So put your clamp as high as possible uh, at the top. So you can use either chitwood clamp or flexible clamp or 15 degree waist straight small clamp also that can be used for clamping the uh, SNE aorta uh, for your AVR. Uh, either you can use a, a osteal or the way we use it for our conventional surgery. Aortotomy, you, mu you must take a, uh, some sort of uh, stay when the, uh, the aorta is full because once the aorta is collapsed, once the clamp is on, once the plagia is given, it is difficult to identify the place for aortotomy. So once the aorta is full, you play, uh, uh, take a few stitches uh, for future aortotomy. Exposure of the, once you have done the aortotomy, how you can expose your valve. So take few commercial stays that will all, and pull it hard and bring it from this incision that will again uh, bring a complete annulus towards the surgeon side, towards the right side. That also uh, will expose your valve uh, in a better way. Then uh, once you have excised completely, so uh, uh, remember the principles of uh, excision and then taking the sutures. Uh, always start uh, from the accessible area. When you have to cut something, you try and uh, cut from the accessible area to non-accessible area. And when you have to fix it back, or when you have to suture it back, take a sutures from a non-accessible area to accessible area. And that is what I do it for most of my cases. And once you have done with this, aerotomy always closed in two layers. Uh, again, a point to be remember that when you want to put a pacing wire, put a pacing wire when the clamp is on and uh, check all bleeding while you are on pump. Again, uh, I'll, uh, this is one of the uh, video of AVR. Whatever I said, I should try and follow those steps. So as I mentioned earlier, second space, a uh, very small uh, anterior thoracotomy. 
around five to six centimeter incision. Uh, I try and avoid uh, sacrificing right internal memory artery and uh, um, disarticulate cartilage. I do not do it generally. And once in this uh, particular case, you see some flimsy additions uh, uh, within the pericardial cavity itself. You know? So I try and uh, remove those additions with the, uh, whether it is sharp, whether it's sharp or with the help of cautery to avoid uh, unnecessary bleeding. I'm sorry. Bye. So here you see, see exactly the complete SNE Yoda in your view. And again, the CPB is the same, like uh, what I just I've showed you for uh, mitral wall. So I'll not go into this. Open cell danger technique again for arterial cannulation. I'm sorry. I'm My video is not working well. Yeah. So this was, I was talking about. Uh, in this particular case, I've used a very small uh, clamp, 15 degree clamp, and will stick to the side of the incision. And then osteal cardioplasia, the way we do it for conventional, and then take a multiple stay sutures that will expose your aortic wall. And the aortic wall has been excised. So I usually start from uh, junction of RCC and NCC and then uh, go along the uh, clockwise fashion. And once the wall is excised, I usually use uh, inverted mattress sutures using polyester two zero suture. And again, never oversize your wall. And this is what I was talking about, this clamp. And once you have the ball is placed uh, and then tie your notes and the rest procedure is the same. Always close your aortotomy in two layers. The, the left side of the heart is vented to RSPV. And at the end of the earring is to be done through aortic uh, uh, root. In mini ASD, what else? Uh, 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 Certain points that we look for is a left SUC. If there is a left SUC, how we can deal with this left SUC? So obviously, if it is draining into coronary sinus, you put a sucker into coronary sinus once you have opened the RA. As I said, uh, for a PAPVC, always uh, use one space above uh, of mid of the RA. Uh, we use a two-stage cannula to close the ASDs. And uh, uh, always, all the time, I start uh, closing ASD from the inferior margin. Uh, usually, take a, uh, uh, if the margin is absent on the IVC side, I take a mag magun stage and close with a patch. And just show you the video of uh, ASD. And this is how we take a pericardial stay and uh, very small. So again, thoracotomy, more anteriorly for same like uh, mitral and aortic cannulation strategy will be the same. Only in case where you think that two-stage cannula will come in your way, or there's a PAPVC type of uh, ASD where you might have to cannulate SVC separately, or else even our anesthetist people can help us by putting a cannula into the right jugular vein for upper body drainage. In this particular case, we have used uh, uh, both these cannula, uh, one for IVC and one for uh, SVC separately through the incision. And looping the SVC and IVC, uh, this is what uh, taking a posting for, sorry. Then going back to the same one. Yeah, this is see um, in most of the cases what we do is uh, uh, this is just dissecting the uh, 
group between the PA and SVC, and then put your mixture from left to right rather than, uh, sorry, right to left, rather than left to right. Same goes for uh, IVC, the separate cannula for upper body drainage. And this, this is what we do it for uh, IVC per string, IVC looping. And once the patient is on pump, once the clamp is on, and cardioplegia has been delivered. Here, what you see is the ASD nicely ASD seen. In this particular case, we are suturing with uh, a 5 0 polypropylene continuous fashion in two layers. So rest of the procedure is almost same like mitral and aortic and two layers closer of uh, RA. And same sutures back uh, the cannulation site. So I will go now to the next, how CABG can be done. So uh, certain points that you must remember when you do a mid cap, the stay sutures, uh, th these are on the pericardial edge and deep pericardial stay and use a sponge placement. That is a game changer. And that is how we can expose your uh, multi vessels, whether it is a low MPD or LED and diagonals. You try and use a long ports and long zero forceps, especially for PDA and your OM for your anastomosis and proximal anastomosis. Keep try and keep systolic pressures of 80, around 80. Uh, because when you lift the heart for OM and PDA, if the pressures are really hard, uh, very high, then and, and especially the heart is big or hypertrophied heart, uh, it is difficult to do an astamosis. So uh, bring the pressures to 80 or, or sometimes you go below 80 and do your uh, difficult anastomosis OM and PDA. In case of irritable heart, always use the right uh, femoral femoral bypass. That would be very easy but do not uh, empty heart completely. Uh, go on a partial bypass because once you go on a complete bypass, uh, once the heart is become emptied, everything is will go from quite away from you. Your oct octopus also will not stay on the heart surface. So what you can do in difficult scenario, uh, uh, go on pump, but uh, only partially. Uh, for uh, Lima retractors, that is very helpful, not only for harvesting the lima, but again, for doing proximal anastomosis for OM and PDA, you keep the uh, lima retractor intact. You lift the chest up with the lima retractor, especially for OM and PDA anastomosis. And uh, uh, if possible, in initial few cases, you try and use your graph flow meter with color imaging. That will give you a, a confidence that yes, your anastomosis are doable, workable, and will have a long term potency if if you have it uh, and especially when you stuck in between when the vessels are intramyocardial this tool also will help you or guide you to tell you that uh, this uh, vessels will be somewhere here and try to use a shunt and uh, if you do not uh, uh, have uh, or you think that the shunt uh, will not, especially in a very small caliber artery shunt, sometimes it may not go, then just occlude the proximal vessels. That also will work in, in any of the coronary, coronary bypass. And uh, try and do a, a, uh, anastomosis in an open book fashion. Uh, that will again, uh, will uh, give, uh, give you a boost of confidence and ease of anastomosis. So do not try and change your anastomosis uh, the way you do it for conventional. You stick to your anastomotic technique, even if you with mid cap. And this is just one of the video of mid cap. This is how you have to drip your patients for mid cap, 15 degree right lateral positions and paint and drip in such a way that even in cat catastrophe, you can immediately convert them into sternotomy. Uh, again, uh, your incision is always sub memory. Uh, more um, uh, medially and laterally. Uh, so halfway 
on the mid clavicular line and halfway of the lateral to the mid clavicular line. This is how we can place the lima retractor. So once you place the lima retractor, remember that it has to place laterally on the in the incision. So when you try and put it more medially, you might injure the lima uh, while putting a retractor. So this is how we harvest lima with pedicle uh, using a long uh, artery, uh, long cautery uh, tip and long forceps. They are uh, made for minimal invasive uh, lima. This is how uh, this is how it's seen. So once you have uh, done with the top, uh, we heparinize them and then uh, we harvest till the top. And this is and once it reaches to the incision, that means you are harvested completely. So this lima also can go up to apex of the LED. So this is one of the freak. Uh, yes, lima also can be done through the same incision. Only thing that you have to, you have to just see that this the blade side direction of the blade that you have to shift from lateral to the medial. So that again will lift the sternum and the costal cartilage uh, and uh, towards more medially. So this is what you see. I have put everything on the medial aspects of the for harvest for uh, Rima conduit. And once you have done with this, uh, open the pericardium. Till you are harvested Lima or Rima, you do not open pericardium at all. Because once you've done this, everything will come in your way of uh, 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 surgery. So once you've done this, this is how you fix the uh, side of the Y with multiple, take multiple CA sutures and fix to the skin level. And this is how you fix it. This is how you push, uh, put your retractor for LED. Uh, this is what you, uh, very routine octopus that uh, in most of the cases that we use. This is for diagonal and then we'll come bring to the LED. There are multiple uh, uh, patients. We, the, this is just for demonstration purpose that uh, in this particular case, we have used a new octopus that is non sternomy octopus for, uh, and then use uh, shunt all, if possible, use shunt for almost all your uh, grafting. Try and use very small bulldogs. And this is for OM. This is, this is uh, in first case that we have used the Lima and Rima. In this particular case, we have used the Lima and Radial. And by doing the Y, we can do a four or five anastomosis. So what I was talking about is take a pericard as much as pericardial stay and take a one dip pericardial. This is how you have to mark the side of the anastomosis on the graft. So you have the adequate length. These are edited videos of uh, multiple patients for just for a demonstration purpose. In most of the patients, we use a very normal uh, stabilizer. And this is the, the end. Again, I, you see, I push my notes with the middle finger. And the end of the anastomosis, at least take a, a, a pical pericardium and bring it back. That will uh, prevent the herniation of the hard uh, into the thorax and at the end you put a one drain at the base of the thorax for the drainage and, and reapproximate your ribs with the phi zero, not phi zero, exactly phi number phi polyester sutures that is uh, easy, easily available. And this is what you see at the end results. And uh, just a tip for proximal anastomosis, 
when you have to do a proximal anastomosis, when you put a vein on the uh, aorta, you mark the vein with the methylene blue, and this is what we do. And uh, most of the time, we take the grafts on the left side of the heart, and uh, uh, how to identify, how to judge the length of the graft. So what we do is we put a clip, a big medium size, a large clip at the side of the appendage, left atrial appendage. That gives us a fair idea that this much remaining uh, length is required. How to expose the uh, aorta for the proxim proximal anastomosis? So there are certain um, steps that we usually follow. Shift the lima retractor more medially than laterally. That also will expose and will have a, a better room for proximal anast for uh, for SNA aorta. Take a silk stay sutures on the aorta pulmonary groove, maybe two stitches, one at the annular side and one on the top, and then pull it to the surgeons and push it, pull, pull it as hard as possible. That also bring the aorta more towards left. Put a gauze piece between SVC and aorta. So that also push the uh, aorta more toward left. And take a deep pericardial stay brought out to the and take to the skin more medially. Right. So when you do this, you have a more room where you can see actually aorta uh, clearly. Uh, then if the PA is really big, if the PA is very dilated, then use an octopus but and put it over the uh, PA and then push the PA more inferiorly and posteriorly. But remember, apply a very low suction, right? Otherwise, you may damage the pulmonary artery. Tell your uh, anesthetist to inflate the right lung. In fact, hyperinflate the right lung. That also brings the aorta more towards the left. Keep the systolic pressures around 80 to 100, never less than 100, because what happens when you keep the pressure 60 or 50 or 40, uh, you, you will not able to catch the aorta with your side biting clamp. And uh, one more step that you can do is you ask again to uh, make more head up positions. That also brings the aorta towards uh, more of the left side for better visualizations of SNE aorta. Side biting clamp. You can ease, either use a rigid, but you remember, you must use a long rigid clamp, data clamp, or now a very flexible porta clamp is available. That also can be is very helpful. They are available in different sizes that you can choose from the size of the aorta. It comes from 46 millimeter to 66 millimeter. If your aorta is very dilated, very big and lengthy, you can actually use 66 millimeter size side bedding clamp. Otherwise you can use the only 46 millimeter very standard size of it. Sutures, uh, you actually use a 13 or 10 millimeter 60, but use a very long sutures. Either it can be 75 sutures, uh, length of sutures should be at least 75 or 90 centimeter, and always use a note pushers to tie your notes. Uh, this is what I've just discussed about you. Again, open book technique for all my anastomosis. Uh, and this is uh, just for uh, interest uh, how it can be done for better exposure of uh, aorta. As I said, uh, one pericard dip pericardial stage and pull out from the skin on medially. Take a couple of uh, sutures on the aorta pulmonary groove and bring the aorta towards you. Uh, in this particular case, we have used a long dera clamp, side bedding clamp. Uh, for a pro proximal anastomosis, use a long 11 blade needle. Uh, if you have long uh, no, uh, aortic punch, that is well and good. If you don't have a long aortic punch, what I do is I cut the plunges on the side and that, that uh, in in increase the visualization of the aorta. And I can do it uh, even with the help of uh, normal aortic punch. Again, open aortic book technique for anastomosis. Uh, so you can easily put one or two uh, proximal anastomosis easily. Doing third is a bit difficult only in cases where you think that the aorta is really big, you can do it, but otherwise it's difficult. So two is easy. So I put a gauze piece on the right side of the aorta, uh, the grooves, uh, sutures on the aorta pulmonary groove. One skill 
uh, and take to the medial side of the um, chest and rigid uh, long uh, side wetting clamp. And push and switches your nodes with the node pushers. And keep that uh, there only. Once you're happy that no bleeding, then only take out this uh, side wetting clamp. And then put a clip at the side of the LA appendage. And in this particular case, we have used a different uh, octopus, the octopus from Theramo. That is a metallic one. And there's a bleeding. I'm just checking the flow of the anastomosis, present anastomosis. So if uh, people are interested, even mini cough also can be done through mini minimal excess. Point to be remembered, I do it from a left anterior thoracotomy. And how I decide the space, again, that is a base on x-ray, uh, whichever space falls into RVOT, I go to that space, whether it is third or fourth or second. Looping of SVC and IVC, once a patient is arrested, is arrested, that is how we look the SVC and IVC. Every cross clamp vertically through a second left intercostal space. So we put a small step through on the left side of the uh, ICS and put it through a separate skin incision. Scardoplegia is again integrated. Uh, went the left side of the system through a left atrial appendage. And uh, what we do is RVOT resection first and then VSD closure and then uh, most of the time RVOT patch augmentation that is uh, at the end. Just a very quick video of it. This was done way back, uh, almost a few years back. In this particular case, we have used both uh, uh, for internal jugular, for SVC drainage, and left uh, right femoral for uh, IVC drainage. And this is what we do. Uh, in fact, in this particular case, we harvested the pericardium from left thoracotomy. And this is where uh, uh, we put a uh, LA appendage vent to a separate incision. And at the end, from the same incision, we put an intercostal drainage tube. Femoral cannulation. As I said, the exciting thing to do is also that we can the It's like a 20 kg boy. Integrated cardioplegia, and in this particular case, we use the uh, clamp from a same incision. But in difficult scenario, we can always use, use a different skin step for the OD clamping. Again, IVC and IVC looping. So we do it when the heart is arrested, and this is how we open the RVOT between the two stay switches. And then cut the bundles, accessory muscles. And once you're happy with your resection, I uh, use uh, some most of the time continuous switches for BSD closure, myeline BSD. Is it five zero for the clean or sometimes six zero if the child is really small? And once uh, you are happy with the resections and VSD is closed, the next step would be uh, augmenting the RVOT with uh, using pericardial patch, treated pericardial patch with neutrality height. And once everything is done, this is how we tear our uh, and then we take we take uh, we always measure RVOT pressures and. Uh, we take uh, saturations from R and PA both. You know these whether the shunt is remained or not. So this is again a mini bental. Uh, if uh, I, I don't know whether the time uh, permits me or not, please let me know whether people are interested to see mini bental. So I can go ahead and. Two in two minutes. 
So whenever you have a, a dilated aortic root and the proximal ascending aorta is dilated, then uh, we can definitely do it through a mini sternotomy or mini uh, thoracotomy. Uh, in most of the aortic wall, when we have to do a isolated aortic wall, we go through a second space, but when we have to do a mini bental, I prefer to go through a third space instead of second space. So the sequence of anastomosis is like wall conduit placement, then left button, then I do a distal anastomosis, and then the right button. And obviously, uh, uh, take your own time, and uh, the hemostasis has to be perfect when you do a, a mini bentals. I just show you a very quick video of it. Again, the in this particular case, I've opened from second, but I'm sure that uh, uh, I, I don't know whether I open from second or not, but it is difficult when you go through a second. So I, I try and excise all the peri, uh, pericardial or thymus uh, fat and take as much as possible time, uh, pericardial steel. The cannulation strategy is the same from a right femur femoral bypass. Venting is again through our RSPB. Clamp uh, with using a 15 degree uh, straight clamp. And this is how uh, we arrest the heart using a osteal cardioplegia. And dissect uh, everything uh, with the help of cautery if possible. And this is what you see is the left main and right coronary button being harvested. This is what you see is left button. And then once you are done with the left, the next is uh, harvest the right button. Sorry, uh, this is just a pause button. Something is going on. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. So then, um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the first is the conduit uh, placement. Second is the left coronary button. In most of the time, I use a 5-0 polypropylene on double arm needle. Take a very thick and um, um, thick bites and uh, keep a equal distance, not too far. First fix the the inferior or posterior margin of the button, then comes upwards. Yeah. Then once you're done with this, then the next step would be to do a distal anastomosis. And then once you're done with the distal, the right is being re-implanted. Same similar fashion. And this is the final picture of it. Dear needles. So I, I use the 16 bore or 18 bore a uh, couple of needles to dear the left side of the heart. And then once you're happy, take out the vent. They can use it. And that's it. Uh, even mini DVR also is, it can be done uh, in selected group of patients. It, so I will not go into depth because everything is almost been seen here. So to conclude my talk, uh, 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 most of the routine cardiac surgeries can be done through a minimum invasive cardiac surgery, whether it can be valve, whether it can be some sort of congenitals, ASDs, 
some VSDs, some tetralogies. And uh, in fact, uh, even the valves are repairable. They also can be done through the same approach. A uh, few even reduce also can be done through a uh, minimal uh, excess approach. Uh, total arterial uh, CABCs also can be done through the same approach. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, even ventiles also can be done through uh, by using very small incision using th small thoracotomy. So uh, if you if you if you have learned it uh, in a hard way, and if you learned it from the master, these surgeries I would say very safe, very doable, and give you a very long term results. So thank you very much uh, for your all kind attention and. Once again, I must uh, thank uh, IPDI for having me for this uh, online symposium. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So if there are any it's questions. It's a great lecture, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, it is a elegant lecture. I think, our, uh, I before I discussion, go to the Dr. Siam, Ashur Siam. I like to thank uh, Abbott, Abbott and uh, Spondon. Here, Mr. Imam and also Shurita and Angshuban Malakar here from Spondon Limited in Bangladesh. Also thank Biximko Pharma. They are with us last one year as a scientific partner. Dr. Shyam, Ashur Shyam, do you, you hear me? Yes, yes, I'm hearing. Please continue, please continue thank your yes, session. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mohsen, sir. It's my pleasure to be a part of this session. I am very grateful and thankful to IPDI for arranging such a wonderful session about the tips and tricks of uh, MICS. Now, I want to say something about Mr. Uh, Dr. Chirag Dushi. He is my direct boss. I am, uh, today I am here with the help of him. Uh, I met with him uh, one and uh, uh, half a year ago in Ahmedabad. Uh, before I met with him, I, I had some bad experience and I have some uh, bad thinking about the uh, MICS. I thought that uh, uh, the cardiac surgeons who are doing MICS, it may be they are compromising uh, the uh, grafting in CVG or uh, compromising uh, in uh, compromising uh, the multiple grafts in CVG. Or uh, in MICS, DVR not uh, should be uh, uh, maybe not done or mental is not possible through MICS. When I met with him, I saw the different cases, the lot of cases of what he uh, have seen here, and uh, uh, he made me wrong. After that, we uh, began our journey in NICBD, and within one year, we have uh, done a lot of cases. We have done ASD, single valve, double valve, and now we are doing the multiple grafts in NICVD through MICS. We have done two or three grafts in CVG regularly in NICVD, and we are uh, practicing it uh, regularly. Then uh, in last year, we had uh, arranging in NICVD a, uh, a live workshop in MICS. Mr. Doshi came here and he uh, uh, done three cases in uh, NICBD. And uh, one thing is uh, that uh, assuring that the Mr. Uh, Doshi is the fastest MICS surgeon in the world I have ever seen. So uh, now it is uh, very, uh, I am very grateful to him. And uh, again, I say that uh, uh, Dr. Professor Wadusar is my direct teacher. He's hearing me, Mohsin Bhai is hearing me. And uh, I am very much thankful to them. And thank you, IPDI, for arranging such a nice discussion. Mohsen sir, hearing me? Hello. Hello. Uh, I think uh, uh, this is a surgeon session. So yes. I think uh, 
your surgical seniors and uh, your colleagues, they may be having a lot of questions. Uh, I see the name of Dr. Shuman Nadnur Hussain. Are you here, Shuman? Dr. Shuman, are you here? And I also want to know about, uh, I, I also think Suleiman Bhai, perhaps. Yes, I'm here, Radhud Bhai. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, an excellent session. I was really, um, it was amazing. I was just looking how uh, Dr. Chirak Deshai was showing his works. He's a master craftsman. I, I really uh, salute you. Um, minimal invasive cardiac surgery is actually absolutely special skill required here. Uh, you, you have to start early, I think, in, in your career. And uh, in Bangladesh, we are very happy that at least some of our surgeons, uh, initially Dr. Prashanto Chando, and then Dr. Ashraful Oksiam, they have taken initiatives to uh, carry out the torch of this unique uh, piece of art. And I, I'm very much hopeful that uh, this will be uh, a very flourishing chapter of cardiac surgery. Uh, with their leadership. Uh, what, what, uh, and uh, I hope that the, these pioneers, those who have already acquired the technology, they will take initiative to technology transfer to other institutions of the country so that uh, other surgeons who are interested, they can also keep up the pace and join the band Bogman. And I'm again, I'm, I'm thanking Dr. Chirak Doshi, uh, Wadud Bhai, Mohsin, and IPDI for arranging this wonderful session. Um, uh, thank you all. If there is any queries or questions or tips, uh, you can ask freely to Dr. Chirak, Dr. Sumon and others. Uh, if the cardiac surgeon do not have any question, I have some comments. Hello. Yes, Pradeep. Uh, Pradeep, yeah. uh, Lokman, why? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Doshi, for your excellent presentation. And I must thankful to the IPDI to arrange such a wonderful session among the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon. I have arranged the, the second session uh, between the cardiologist and cardiac surgeons because we have, we have to work together. The development of cardiac surgery, we have to know as a cardiologist. On the other hand, the cardiac surgeons also have to know the, what, how the cardiology also advancing. In this, in this forum, I've gone through the members, as 60 doctors has participated, but 80% are cardiologists. So it is, it is showing there the cardiologist has the interest to the cardiac surgeon, how they are developing. Thank you. I have uh, some queries to the Dr. Joshi. Toshi. Uh, what is the role or how can you approach the uh, in emergency surgery in MICS approach, especially uh, being an interventional cardiologist in, in, in left main cases, emergency left main cases and emergency coronary or chamber perforation, number one. Number two, what is the, what is the incidence of uh, hybrid approach in your center or or in the in the in the MICS era in where right coronary is uh, intervened by the intervention cardiologist and left by you uh, then third question what is the uh, MICS has been done will be done in a in a patient with antiplatelet thank you 
Uh, first of all, thank you so much um, for your uh, very valid and um, very good questions that you've come up with, that you have raised as an intervention cardiologist. Having said that, uh, you rightly said uh, whether the surgeries can be done in emergency situations or not, right? Uh, people who have just started doing it, I would say uh, one should not take up those challenging cases because any form of emergency is challenging, right? So you have a time limitations and you have to do a job very correctly and with, within a time frame. So uh, people who are less experienced, I would say, once they have enough experience of minimal invasive cardiac surgery, doing emergency is not that challenging. I'll just give you a small example. For an example, like uh, in, in my own um, centers, in a lot of instances, a lot of uh, times, a lot of cases, that has been referred to me on an emergency basis for minimal invasive only approach. For example, ASD, like cardiologist is putting ASD device and then the device is embolized. Yeah. yeah. Is because in most of the time, this group of patients, they are either young patients or female when they, uh, you know, approach for device. So then in, we have a lot of surgeons working in our center. But whenever some sort of cases happens, they immediately call me, you know, to yeah. do a perform yeah. surgery through a mix. So I say, yes, this surgery also can be done in cases like embolized ASDs, even chamber perforations. If the perforation, you know the perforation is, is either even if from right side or of example like post BMB a perforation. So if I know that perforation is in the IDC or in the RA, but if it is perforated in these some of the pulmonary veins, right? If it is right, it is okay. I can go through a light, I fix the perforation, even I, I can fix the mitral valve in the same setting. If somebody insists me to do through mini only, then I go through a right, I fix the valve. If I can see perforation from inside the LA, I fix it then and there. If not possible, I, I in fact open the left side of the heart, left thorax, and I can fix the atrial appendage or left pulmonary system through a left side of this incision. So patient will have a two incision, but two small incision on the bilateral chest. So here we can avoid sternum. Second, it is possible to go on a quick pulmonary bypass because when you, your, the time is constrained, when patient is in tamponade. I would say going on pump is a bit easier, quicker. In fact, we can do a per cutaneous uh, cannulations with no time. You just have to puncture femoral artery and femoral vein. And in most of the uh, per cutaneous approach, they've already cannulated a femoral artery and vein. Sheets yeah. are already yeah. clean. So you can on, only have to replace with the cannula. So with no time, one can go on pump. Right? One can avoid this uh, 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 losing blood uh, situation. Third question, uh, third thing that you would ask me is about coronaries. If whether a patient is with ongoing pain, with ongoing disease changes, with critical left main, whether this case, surgeries can be done on those, those patients or not. Having said that, if the hemodynamics are okay, once, because in this, uh, once you have done Lima to LAD, right, things are uh, there's no more left main or there's no more critical LED, right? And while doing Lima to LED, you do not manipulate hard at all. So if you, if you, if you maintain the pressures adequate, then doing Lima LED, beating hard is not a big job. Having said that, even if somebody wants to do it uh, with pump, they can always go on a femoral uh, bypass and open the chest and finish their surgeries with the use of pump. Right, that is number two. Number three, number three questions that you would ask me is, uh, I just, I just, can you, can you recollect uh, hybrid, the hybrid procedure? Yes, the hybrid procedure. Yeah. Hybrid. Yes, yes. Uh, very valid thing because it is now established science. Hybrid procedures. 
In fact, it has come in ESCTS guidelines few years back. It is now a 2P indications where surgeons are doing mid-cap lima to LED, and then the intervention cardiologists they, they do it uh, RC or LCX class T either in the same sitting or later date. You know. So yeah. here the question is, uh, one of the questions: if I can do, if I can produce a uh, excellent result through mid-cap by doing by providing total arterial total reverse pressure then whether i should do a hybrid or not that's a question number one yeah. second when when hybrid first i think cardiologists have taken uh, rca first because a patient has come in a uh, some sort of uh, uh, non stemi or stemi and rca is critical they opened up rca and then led is also uh, chronically diseased but that can be dealt later on now the antiplatelets because yeah. once you put the patients on stand once the stent is in stopping the antiplatelet for a one month is 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 challenging right dual antiplatelet especially aspirin should not be a problem when patient is on dual antiplatelet uh, then um, i would say those are the group of patients they may have a, a more bleeding uh, situations then when patient is off antiplatelet or patient with single antiplatelet right having said that most of the time uh, minimally invasive uh, or mid cap they bleed less the reason why i say bleed less because the sternum is intact we do not take wires and most of the oozing that take place is from the sternum or the wires that we uh, taken at the end of the procedure to fix the sternum back right and so the the dissection is minimum uh, here we do not cut the bone at all so the bleeding is uh, less as compared to the sternum sternotomy so uh, yes hybrid procedures can be done uh, rather i would encourage the people to do it more and more hybrid procedures where uh, to for a better and long term results right thank you Because thank you very much that to please become gold standard Uh, through a mid cap. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am Dr. Lokmanu Sen. First, I congratulate Dr. Cherak Dushai from your lecture. You cover A to Z minimally invasive cardiac surgery. If the learners learn from you, it is very easy to take up the minimally invasive cardiac surgery. One thing I believe. the way of learning is very very important so you give the lecture from your very large elaborate experience so in our bangladesh dr siam and the dr prashant chando give that opportunity from you one thing i believe in our context in our country we have to start in tertiary hospital corporate chef hospital where there are so many bulk of patient is there so we can make a team dedicated team for minimal invasive and other conventional so cm studies is very nicely in the government sector it is our national heart center it is our heart center you know in bangladesh so i congratulate him and prashanto now in another center square he will procure the instrument and he is running very nicely i think and i hope i have a plan in levit cardia hospital we will make this uh, instrument available then we will start very soon in the year 2010 when i was in uh, khaza university medical college hospital it's a rural hospital cardia center on that hospital i have done two valve cases and one cvg cases they have a minimally invasive instrument but after coming back to dhaka i cannot make it the instrument available in my hospital from your lecture i sure in our levit cardiac hospital we will very soon start this minimally invasive because we have a very large volume case we are operating maximum cvg and the valve cases so today i first congratulate the IPDDI, you know the cardiologist and cardiac surgeon is moving different way. Today's 
program make us warnings and experience shared. So the question from Pradeep Kumar, I very much happy. He is very courageous to know from us actually what happening. If we run cardiac surgeon and cardiologist in our country, one thing I believe all things we will done for the benefit of the patient. If we give the good service to our patient, everybody will be happy. So I mean, our request Rakbo, Dr. Cherak Dushai, give your fine trips regularly in our Bangladesh so we can make a very good dedicated minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Thank you very much. Prashanto, can you start? Uh, thank you for all the comments and questions. Uh, one uh, question I like to know from Dr. Uh, Chirag. Uh, in all cases for CBG, you used to use PA catheter or not? And what is your policy if you like to go for groin cannulation for emergency C CPB? Um. First of all, thank you so much, Dr. President General. Uh, because for last few years, I've been in contact with you as well as Dr. Sian, and I see both growing exponentially in the field of minimal invasive cardiac surgery. Uh, so you are like a hero uh, uh, in Bangladesh. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy for both of you. I, I, I see a tremendous progress of Dr. Siam also. Is very energetic, enthusiastic, and a very progressive surgeon, right? Uh, so uh, I, 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 it is always my honor to be interact with you all, all always. So uh, yes, uh, uh, you said uh, the grind cannulation one, and second is uh, uh, you asked me about uh, PA catheter. PA catheter. PA catheter, right? Uh, honestly speaking, a few years back, we used to use PA catheter is almost always in my all CBG patient, whether it was mid cap or open uh, cases. But nowadays, we have restricted ourselves uh, to a very selected group of patients where the heart is really sick. It's less than 20% with M MS or MR, something sort of valvular pathologies associated with uh, uh, CBG. Only in those cases, we put up PA catheter. Otherwise, nowadays we do not put PA catheter at all. It's just the triple lumen central line uh, catheter that we usually uh, uh, insert. Uh, the reason, few reasons that why we do not use PA catheter very frequently, because uh, nowadays the eco machine is very well available with in our ICU in our theater that has replaced uh, PA completely. You know. And the uh, second thing, uh, uh, this is what our personal observations, once we put a PA catheter, uh, when patient been shifted to ICU, and ICU is mainly managed by uh, intensivist or resident or staff, they hardly uh, use PA, you know? In fact, uh, uh, we do not find any extra benefits of PA catheter versus CVP, central venous pressure, only, right? So we have uh, now a very limited role of PA catheters. Uh, if I operate 100 CVPs in a month, maybe one or two patients will have a PA catheter only. And honestly, 90% of my patients uh, will have a LV of 30 or 35% max. So we do not uh, uh, now in a very few of uh, PA catheter one. Second question to your uh, second part of your question was uh, how to cannulate when uh, in, in, in emergency uh, mid cap, right? So in that particular case, what we do is when, when you have an emergency, uh, either you have a bad ECG or second is bad hemodynamics. So in this two scenario, you might have to go on a pump, right? So what are the options to go on pump? Either you convert into sternotomy or else you go on a femoral femoral bypass. 
So in this particular case, what we in, in all the patients, what we do is we always mark our femoral vessels when the patient is in supine position, when even you, when you just induce the patients. So what we do is we mark the femoral uh, vessels, artery and vein with the markers, right? When the pressure is 60 or 50, you will not uh, able to palpate even femoral artery, right? So one is either you mark it. Second, when you have in doubt, when you think that the, uh, the heart is sick, when you think that the, uh, the ECG is ongoing ECG changes, when you think that the criticality of vision is very severe, like left main disease, instead of marking, what you can do is you put a guide wire into femoral vein and femoral artery before even you start your procedures, right? And then you start, you do procedures. And if you think that you need, you have to go on pump, you just, uh, you have to just insert your cannula into the over the guide wires and will not take more than two minutes to do it, you know? So this is how uh, we go on pump. And thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience, especially from surgeons? Uh, because we are running, uh, we have taken two or more than two hours. So if there is any queries from surgeon. Okay, can I ask one more question? Uh, yeah. What is your policy for LA appendix during mitral valve surgery? Uh, in your routine practice, you close it from inside or? So, so what uh, my strategy is, the patient is in uh, atrial fibrillation, right? If LA is really big, then I try and close it from within only, right? So uh, what I do is I use a 4-0 polypropylene on 26 needle, and I do it, I close it in a linear fashion from within the LA in two layers. But remember, the needle should not pass through and through, right? If they pass through and through, they bleed at the end. And then tackling that bleed from the right thoracotomy is, is a very difficult job. A hell of a job, right? So, so this is what I do. If patient is uh, uh, PF, if patient is definitely a quad, definitely I would close it from within. If the LA is enlarged, even if they are in sinus rhythm, I try and close from within. Okay. Yeah, many. Uh, 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 okay, Doctor Mohsin. Proceed uh, for closing and others. Okay, thank you. I think I think uh, we are running for the two hours time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dr. Sure. Dr. Chirag, Dr. Chirag Doshi also uh, give lots of time. I think in future, near future, he will talk another topics and and uh, Dr. Siam, do you uh, any comments? Dr. No, Siam, already I have done. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, tomorrow uh, we have another class. Far 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 uh, one minute. Uh, Farooq sir is here, but but he's not uh, he's not unmute. I think I'm uh, trying to unmute uh, him. But, uh, unmute him. Uh, tomorrow uh, another class. It is interesting uh, class uh, for CMR and cardiac CT. It is for interesting for the also surgeons uh, and the yeah yeah yeah, 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 yes, sure, 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 yes. Sure. I think at, at, at 10 p.m. Friday, uh, Doctor Farooq sir, do you hear me? Yeah, yes, I hear you clearly. Ah. Sir, sir, thank you, sir, for coming with us, sir. A few comments, sir. No, no more comments. There are so many comments, and I met uh, Dr. Chirag Dashi. He's a nice, good, and very competent MSC surgeon. Uh, what I like to mention is that we like to start it here in Bangladesh in a regular fashion. Only a very handful of surgeons are practicing or trying to do it. So I wish all my surgeons, all of the surgeons of our country, can proceed to it. But before that, uh, what I feel, someone has to be very competent in regular surgery in normal sternotomy and should be a very confident one. If he's confident in doing the service regularly, then only he should proceed for MICS. And for MICS, this hemostasis is very important to me, as I feel uh, we can take chance uh, for hemostasis, uh, hemostasis problem. And with these things, as we are progressing, hopefully we'll be doing it in a regular fashion in our country. And at the same time, I'll seek help from Dr. Chirag Dush on behalf of our surgeons of Bangladesh to help us out in doing the MICS in a regular and a safe fashion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you, Dr. Jagdish. Now I'm requesting Professor Abdulaziz sir, please conclude our session. Professor Wadud sir. Uh, Dr. Jagdish, you have shown beautifully the varieties of cases that can be done through minimally invasive cardiac surgery. I think uh, the whole thing is becoming more attractive to the young surgeons and also to us, the cardiologist, because in these cases, uh, we can encourage the patient because some of the patients are very adamant not to have any sort of surgery. And we know that uh, we can uh, make the right corner quite all right, but the left with its calcification and other things, it's not proper to leave the patient to intervention only, they need surgery. So if you can convince them all right, I will do some part and you do the rest by minimally invasive surgery. Perhaps this group of people, this refusal uh, will be much less and they'll be agreeing to the surgery. And then they will have total revascularization. That should be the idea. The hybrid surgery where both the cardiologist and the surgeons meet together to put together a good, beautiful, productive life for the patients. That should be our goal. Minimally invasive surgery should be the aim of our young surgeons so that we can boast that our patient can walk around within a week, quite all right, without the problem of the pain and the delay for the healing that occurs when you open up the uh, sternum. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. And all the surgeons and all the doctors in the cardiologist who were interested in listening to you, I also thank them. I also thank for arranging such beautiful session. We are doing it, but without your help, we cannot do it. So the moderator, the panelist, and the companies who have supported us. Myself and Dr. Mohsin, we thank you all. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Uh, thanks. Uh, th thanks about also responding. Uh, Dada, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dada. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you again, sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. Stay safe and take care. Thank you to all, sir. Thank you, Angshuman. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we are very much. Thank you for uh, your, proud for, for thank you for nice cooperation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.